Welcome to Journaling with Nature, the podcast for those who want to turn curiosity into wonder, a pencil sketch into a rabbit hole of discovery, a moment of stillness into a life full of joy. I'm your host, Bethan Burton. Let's open the pages of our nature journals and explore this world together. Hello, this is episode 111. I really hope the start of the new year is going well for you and that you're settling back into your routine if work or school has started again for you after the break. Today, my guest is Kelly Ballantyne. Kelly is a Chicago-based bird artist and photographer. In our conversation, we talk about how Kelly came to have such a strong passion for birding in particular and the people and experiences that influenced her becoming a birder. We also talk about her ambitious project, setting out to paint 100 birds from her local forest preserve and birding in all weather, including in the snow. Let's listen. Kelly, thank you for being here with me on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I can't wait to chat with you. I'm wondering if you could tell me, as you know, I start the podcast the same way each time. I wonder if you could tell me where your passion for nature started and if you've had nature in your life for a long time. Yeah. um, So, yes, I I have had nature in my life for a long time, as long as I can remember. Um, I have always lived in the Chicago area when I was growing up. Um, when I was about four or five, we moved to a house in the suburbs that had a backyard that backed up right into the forest preserve. So when we looked out our back window or from our kitchen, like all we saw were the like lovely trees in the forest. And um, I was always obsessed with animals. And so there were squirrels and white-tailed deer and raccoons and then birds and So I was always looking out the window or always playing outside in the woods when I was a kid. And I think that was, I I don't know, that was such a blessing. Like my brother and I, whenever we would, you know, play, it was like, okay, let's go outside into the woods and just explore. Um, I mean, there was video games and that kind of stuff too, but a lot of our, a lot of our playtime was out in those woods. Um, And then in addition to that, just like growing up in such a, wonderful, natureful environment. Um, we also, our grandparents lived in the north woods of Wisconsin. So it was like way, way up north um, in the United States, um, almost to Canada. And my grandparents also lived in the woods and um, my parents would send me and my brother up there every summer. We'd spend like two to three to four weeks up there and just my parents or my grandparents loved um, the outdoors as well. So we'd go berry picking with my grandma or we'd go fishing with both of them. And we we spent a lot of time out out there as well. That sounds absolutely idyllic. (laughs) Yes, it was wonderful. I feel so fortunate. (laughs) (laughs) And you have a particular focus on birds. And I'm wondering about birds and birding and what attracts you to that form above all other forms of natural history and whether there was someone or something that introduced you in particular to birds? Yeah, uh, oh, I love that question. Um, so I think I think that birds have always been a part of my life. Um, like I remember sitting at the window at home with my mom and we had like a field guide and we'd see birds um, or maybe birds would hit the window, unfortunately, <laughs> um, and and we'd try to identify, look through that field guide and figure out what it was. Um, and then my grandmother, the one that lived in Wisconsin, she also loved birds as well. And she had um, bird feeders. So she had hummingbird feeders and feeders for the Baltimore Orioles. Um, and, so, and she knew a lot about birds. So she would teach me the different bird names um, or we might see ducks when we were out fishing. Um, so she was, you know, always kind of talking to me about that. Um, but I, so I think birds have always been part of my life, but mm. I wouldn't say I became like, a birder with a capital B Mm. until like 2016. Um, So part of that was uh, my husband and I had the opportunity to go on vacation in Costa Rica. 
And that was just, I mean, it was such an amazing trip, but I think my initial motivation on going to Costa Rica was to see the sloths oh, because yeah. I mean, those are just such cool, um, such cool animals. And so we did get to see those, but the other thing that was so cool about the trip was birds. And for example, there were just wild scarlet macaws there oh. and they would just be like, we would wake up in the morning and all of a sudden you would hear them like yelling as parrots like to do, just as they were flying from like their overnight roost to going to forage uh, around where we were staying. So that was just like, it's like, oh my gosh, there are just macaws, like just <laughs> hanging out here. That's crazy. <laughs> Um, and then at the same time, my husband's uncle um, had started getting into birding. So like he invited me uh, on some uh, birding trips in the city. Uh, and then I was just hooked. You were hooked. So. <laughs> That's amazing. Sometimes it takes us uh, an experience in a really exotic place like Costa Rica or like seeing, you know, parrots elsewhere to make us realize Oh, actually, there's there's a lot going on here close to home. And I love that you discovered that and started birding around the city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now, I mean, that's where I primarily do all my birding is yeah. in like a very urban area. But it's, I don't know, it, it brings me so much joy. But it's also, it's like, a, you know, almost an exercise in mindfulness mm. because you're really just focused on the present moment and just experiencing what's happening right then. And I'm often able to just let like a lot of the other like worries or pressures and day-to-day -day life, just I can set those aside at the moment and just really focus on like what I'm experiencing. Yeah, that's beautiful. And, and you engage with birding in different creative ways. And I'm wondering what came first for you, bird photography or bird art? Oh, um, yeah. So I definitely, so, you know, when it comes specifically to birds, the photography was um, the first thing. Um, and actually it was, again, that same experience with those scarlet macaws and seeing all of those amazing birds in Costa Rica, because at that point I did not have a camera aside from my phone. And it was great because we would go on guided tours with some naturalists and they would have like these big scopes and they were really good at putting your phone camera up to the scope and being ah, able to take a picture, um, which is very, very challenging to do and actually get a good picture. Um, but I was like, oh, it would be amazing if I actually had a camera with a lens that could, you know, give me a little more detail on the birds. So. Um, that's where that started. Um, but in terms of art, like art has also always been like kind of a part of my life mm. since I could remember. And so I, ha I had, I did not have a regular art practice before I got into birding, but it was definitely something that I um, had explored and that had been a part of my life even beyond like childhood. Tell me, tell me more about that. How did you, uh, did you, learn from others? Did you take classes? How, how did, how was art part of your life? Yeah. So, um, I mean, when I was a kid, I, I just remember that I was drawing all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and most of that, you know, was just pencil or pen or whatever I kind of mm -hmm. had available. Um, I remember the dot matrix printing paper yes. was often my <laughs> medium of choice with yes. whatever pencil I had available. Um, and then uh, my mom was really good at uh, encouraging my brother and I and whatever, you know, interests or hobbies we had. Um, so as I was kind of going through middle school, she signed, she actually signed both of us up for kind of semi-private art lessons. Uh, and that those lessons were really great because they had it structured where the teacher kind of took us through. First, we started with uh, charcoals. So really teaching us about value and, you know, capturing light and shadow. And then he moved us on to using like soft pastels. So we were working more with color and blending colors. And then we moved on to oil painting. Um, and so, I, I mean, I was probably taking classes there for, I don't know, maybe one to two years, but I feel like it was really good at 
learning so many different skills. Yeah. Um, and then, and then of course I became a teenager and <laughs> things kind of <laughs> fell apart a little bit. Um, and so I wasn't, I wasn't practicing art very regularly, uh, throughout high school. Um, I was not one of the, you know, the kids that was like in art class mm -hmm. and like super arty as a teenager. I was like, I think I was more worried about like trying to fit in and and all of that and uh, I think I was also intimidated by the the really arty the students. Kids. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um but then like once I got into college, um I started trying to pick it up again because I had just missed it. You know, mm. I I missed uh doing something creative. So, uh so yeah, so uh the bird art uh I would say came about uh, during the pandemic, because mm -hmm. again, it was something like I wanted to, I wanted to make art. I wanted to make more time in my life for creating art, and I treated myself to um, Liz Clayton Fuller's uh, course yes. that she has um, on the uh, Cornell Bird Academy uh, website, and it's just, I mean, it's such a great course on field sketching and bird art, and I took that, and then I've never looked back <laughs> yeah so fantastic and you've you've got this lovely project in progress that you call 100 birds of labar woods and mm -hmm. it started as a way of documenting the birds in your local area i'd love to learn more about this project and about the the woods themselves and uh, how that how that has influenced your bird art yeah absolutely so um Laba Woods is a small section of the forest reserve here in Chicago or in Cook County. Um, and it is the place that I spend um, probably the most time birding and definitely where I birded the most when I first got started. It's really close to my house. It's only about a 10 minute drive away. Perfect. And uh, yeah, it's just, I don't know, it's great. And it's, uh, the the first I remember the first time I went there is like the first time I had been in the woods in a really long time and it kind of just felt like being at home mm. again like I didn't realize how much I missed the woods until I got the chance to just go out and wander around in them again um and Laba is a really important um, stopover site for a mm -hmm. lot of the neotropical migrants that pass through Chicago. And it um, it hasn't always been well treated. So there's, uh, there's a, a huge restoration effort that is um, going on there to try to repair the woods and restore them to um, what they were like back before there were a lot of invasive species and before a lot of damage to the habitat occurred. So, um, yeah, I think I got started with that project just, you know, partly because I love those woods so much. Um, I wanted to make sure I could feature like all of the amazing birds that call it home or use it as like a resting spot uh, when they're on their migratory routes. Because I know, you know, myself as like a lifetime Chicagoan, I had no idea that these amazing birds lived here or at least stopped by here for a few months out of the year before I got into birding. And it was just like, it was so mind blowing <laughs> when I first, and it still like kind of yeah. boggles the mind that you could see something like, you know, a bright orange black birdian warbler who's like so tiny. I mean, they just they're they're so stunning and like how does this bird exist <laughs> One, you know and the fact that it stops here yeah like in chicago is just you know just so fascinating so i i think i you know i wanted to use the art to kind of feature all of those amazing birds and then also you know in a lot of that artwork i also try to feature some of the native uh plant species that help support them either by you know providing them shelter or providing them food or providing food for the food that the birds eat nice. <laughs> so yeah uh, yeah yeah how do you choose who gets featured as the next bird in your project <laughs> 
that's a great question. Um, <laughs> usually it's the, it's the bird that I've seen most recently mm -hmm. that I haven't done yet. Mm -hmm. So um, there's, I think at this point, I personally have seen about 160 species wow. at that site. Wow. So I have, like my goal is that I have 100. I think I'm at like 72 right now. Yeah. Um, so I definitely have many birds to play with. But uh, I also try to keep it seasonal. So like if I were going to do one of those um, pieces now, I'd want to try to feature a bird that's there at this time of year, which, you know, we're in the winter season right now in the northern hemisphere. So um, we don't have quite as many species visiting Loba these days, but the spring and the fall, I mean, there's so many to choose from. It can be challenging. <laughs> That's amazing. And I I love, I wanted to talk to you about this, actually. I love that you are out there birding in all weather. I'm so mm. amazed and impressed by that. And um, I read a wonderful blog post you wrote about the Christmas bird count. And oh, yes. I wonder what that's like being out there in the in the winter. And it would be such a different experience than in other seasons. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um so it's funny because before I started birding, I was definitely one of those people that was like, it's below freezing outside. <laughs> I'm not leaving my house. <laughs> like, I'll yes. see you in the spring. Yes. <laughs> um, and then I think, you know, I noticed so many health benefits for myself. Yeah. you know, going out birding regularly that once it got cold, I'm like, I can't let the cold weather keep me from this really important part of my life. Like I just need to figure it out so I can go outside, still enjoy the birds, but not freeze <laughs> um, or feel miserable the whole time. Yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so yeah, I, I figured it out. I have, I have a lot of different gear that I use and I have like, I think I finally have it dialed in for like which temperatures require which gear. Um, but but my most favorite uh, gear that I actually just got this winter is uh, a pair of rechargeable hand warmers. Fantastic. Yes, Useful. they have been <laughs> life changing. <laughs> Because no matter what, like no matter how good a gloves you have or yes. how many layers you have on, like you're if you're out for more than, I don't know, 20 minutes when it's really cold out, your hands are going to be hurting. Um, these rechargeable hand warmers are amazing. I would recommend them to anybody that spends any amount of time when it's cold outside. Um, they're also really inexpensive. Uh, and you could even just use one and it just it keeps your hands nice and toasty. Um, so yeah, like figuring out that gear part of it has really helped me to just like go outside and spend a ton of time outside, like for the Christmas bird count. So that particular event, it is uh, the longest uh, consecutively running community science project wow. in, uh, yeah, in the, in North America, I believe. And um, so it's just fun to like kind of take part in something that has also just like this, uh, historical element to it yeah and um usually it starts at, well i start uh with the early crew because we go out owling so we go out and we listen for uh, different species of owls and so we have to start well before sunrise so we're usually meeting up like before 5 a.m and then we bird all day long uh with a short break for lunch so we might wrap up birding i don't know around 4 4 30 mm -hmm. um th th when uh we are reaching sunset but but yeah, it's it's just really cool. I mean, we're out there, we're just trying to document like what species we're running into and everybody has like different assignments for which areas that they're trying to cover. Um, and this year was so cool because uh, I was with a group of two other people and we were at the end of our Christmas bird cow and we're like, okay, well, we're going to go stop at this one area because last year it was kind of lucky. Like we picked up a couple of species that we hadn't seen yet. So let's go back there. And we were walking along and, um, my friend Audrey and I we were looking at this like bank and there were, we had seen no birds for like 10 minutes or so and we're like oh my god now there's birds there's like juncos and goldfinches by the river and we're looking and then all of a sudden this towhee which is type of sparrow like popped up in front of us and they're not towhees eastern towhees which is the common species here aren't that common at this okay. time of year and audrey was like 
I think that was a spotted towhee. And I was like, what? Spotted towhee? I mean, those are birds that live like out in the western part oh. of North America. So they're they're considered a vagrant species here, meaning they're not usually here. They might drift over here occasionally. So we're like, what? Spotted towhee? This is amazing. Um, and I was able to grab a couple. I had my camera with me, so I was able to grab a couple of shots and we were able to confirm the ID. Wow. Yeah, so it was really exciting. But funnily enough, here Audrey and I are thinking like, we're making history. <laughs> with our sighting and this bird this particular species had actually been seen on this particular christmas bird count at least two other times really? in the history yeah doesn't want to miss so. out <laughs> <I know. laughs> that's so interesting yeah. and then something yeah. like that becomes an event doesn't it when when a bird is a, a native bird is seen in outside of its range Absolutely. Yes. All the birders go crazy and want to see it because <laughs> it's unusual. It's unusual for the state. It's unusual yeah. for the location. So yeah, a lot of people got really excited about that bird. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and so when you choose a bird to paint for your, for your project, I wonder about that. Does it deepen your connection with each bird as you paint it? Do you become more connected to it and do some research and come to know it more than you did? Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think maybe I've heard you say this on the podcast before, but like the more you pay attention to something, the more you fall in love with yes. it. Yeah. And so uh, I definitely find that when I'm working um, on my birds and um yeah, I, my process is uh, when I pick a bird for the 100 Birds of La Ba project, I do like to do some research. I like to figure out, just kind of read as much as I can about the bird, like what their typical behavior is, what they eat, you know, where they're finding food, uh, what their preferred habitats are. Um, I also like to, you know, pay attention to the different plumages, both, you know, if there's differences between the male and females of this species, or if there really aren't any differences, um, because sometimes they look exactly the same. Um, and then if they, and a lot of times they'll look different at different parts of the year as well. Um, so I, I do a lot of research on that. And, and then when I'm just like drawing the bird, so if I have if I have my own reference image, like I've taken that picture and it's, you know, the pose I like or whatever, then I feel like I end up getting really connected with yeah. that particular, even individual, you know? Um, but if I don't, if I'm working off of a number of reference images from other photographers, I still feel like connected with the, uh, the species, if not just the, that particular individual. I love that. I love that idea of making a connection with one bird, not just the species, but that particular bird. And, mm -hmm. and that's the wonderful thing I'm sure about taking your own reference photos is that you're out there and you're watching the behavior as well and seeing and having an experience with that individual, how they're moving, what they sound like. Yeah, but it's a whole different experience, a whole different um, thing to come to know one bird, especially if you're watching a bird in, in your garden that m might be returning again and again. It's a very deep yeah. experience. Yeah, exactly. And that's one of the reasons why um, I, I like birding at the same spots. Like I have a few spots um, in addition to Laba Woods that I visit again and again. And it's because um, you, you not only get to know the place, you get to know like which birds hang out where. And yes. oftentimes you are seeing the same individual. Like sometimes with some species, that's a little bit easier to figure out than others. But um, a few years ago, there was a pair of great horned owls that were nesting um, at Laba, and like I knew where to find them. I knew where they were. I was always like really respectful of their space and not disrupting them. But I got to watch that that owl family raise like three little owlets over the course. You know, it started. You know, I first saw them in I think it was February when the first owlet hatched, and then watching those little babies grow up over the course of a summer, and wow. so that was. That was That's just something else. such a wonderful experience, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Tell me some more about the different, your favorite places to go birding and nature journaling around, mm -hmm. your, around your area. 
Yeah, so um, certainly La Bob Woods is one of them. Um, the other spot that I go most regularly is um, it's a Chicago Park District Park called Park 566. Um, it's It has that number because nobody has bothered to name it, like the city hasn't yes. named it yet. <laughs> yeah. It was just a piece of land that they bought. Um, they actually bought it from uh, the U.S. Steel Corporation. So it's a site of a old uh, steel refinery that was in operation for like over a hundred years. So the site, like it's been through a lot yeah. <laughs> in its time. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have a natural uh, lake shore because it is right on the shore of Lake Michigan. Um, and it's on the Southeast side of Chicago. And there's still a lot of um, the old infrastructure present. And there's a lot of um, industrial like waste, like slag concrete and stuff like that, that is still present within the environment. Um, but one of the reasons I love that spot so much and why I go to it so often is because you can see on a, at least on an annual, you can see nature like taking over yes. this place and reclaiming yes. it. Uh, and there are so many, it's another really great birding spot because you have the lake, so you get all of like the waterfall and you get shorebirds um, and it has grasslands. So there's a ton of like beautiful grassland species. There have been, um, a uh, type of raptor called northern harriers that have been hanging out there like they have been there all fall and now into the winter and it's just um it's yeah it's just really cool to just see nature reclaiming this site that was so industrial not that long ago yeah that is yeah. amazing isn't it to to think about what happens if you just step away and let it be even if we've trashed a place, nature finds a way to regenerate in its own way. And that is quite fascinating to see. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I have done I have done some nature journaling um, out at Park 566. There are some nice spots that are just like kind of natural seats and stuff that you can sit down and, you know, paint the, the lake or, uh, you know, paint the grasslands. Mm. And it's just nice to just sit and be still there. Um, but we um, I'm a part of a nature journaling group here in Chicago. And yes. um, and that is uh, it's such a wonderful group. And one of the things I love about it is each month we meet up and we try to go to a different spot. So it's actually really um, you know, uh, been a great opportunity to learn about some different spots around the city that I hadn't visited before. And they're all like unique and th they often have like varied habitats. And it's just, it's been cool to, to take part in that and get to see those new spots. Yeah. So how does it work? Do you each um, suggest a play? How does, what's the structure of the Chicago Nature Journaling Club? How does it work? Yeah. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, this year, so we have a, a really wonderful uh, person who started the group named Maureen. And she, uh, for the first year, uh, she picked a lot of the sites. She, you know, asked us for input or asked us uh, for ideas. And then this year, uh, we're really like crowdsourcing a little bit more. So asking the other members if, if they have favorite spots and that they would suggest. We try to keep... Um, things as accessible um, for everybody as possible. Yes. So we like to have spots that are close to public transportation um, or that are easily bikeable. Um, but we also have a really great uh, system for carpooling. So if we're at a Excellent. site, you know, that maybe isn't as accessible, we have means that, you know, people that want to join the meetup can reach out to other people so that they can get a ride um, and be able to participate in it. That's so fantastic. And tell me about learning from others in that environment. Like um, I've seen some pictures of the Chicago Nature Journaling Club and you have all the um, journals laid out and sharing and sharing a meal even. I, I wonder yes. what that's like for you to, to learn and to share in that way in community. Yes. Oh, I mean, it's it's honestly it's one of my favorite events every mm -hmm. month uh, mm -hmm. because it's just such a fantastic community. Um, yeah, it's it's great because one of the things that I learned that that keeps coming back to me is that like nature journaling 
it looks different to everybody. And yes. there are so many different forms of nature journaling. Like it doesn't just need to be putting, you know, pen or paint to paper. Um, we have, um, you know, photographers that come to our nature journaling meetups. Um, we have uh, one really wonderful member and she makes these beautiful like crafted um, mosaics basically wow. like some of that is out of um, found stuff from the site that we visited but also she'll take materials at home and make these really lovely mosaics which is just like totally unique um some people uh are, are you know uh more uh, like writers. So they'll sit yeah. and they'll just, you know, journal. Um, we have one um, member who um, she she takes poetry classes. So sometimes she'll like do poems when she's out there. And then we also have a number of artists in the group. Um, and I think what's really fantastic too is we have some um, cartoonists in the group. So wow. like, the yes, um, and those those nature journaling pages are just amazing, but like you normally don't see um, cartoons and nature journaling spreads, you know, if you were to look that up online, but um, his are just so fantastic. And like everybody is showing like their connection to nature and expressing that in their own unique ways. So it's just a wonderful all around learning experience. That sounds amazing. I love that you have such a diverse way. There's, there's, so many different ways of expressing our connection with nature and that really shows up in in your group that's amazing yes. how did you come to nature journaling in the first place mm, uh that's a great question so i i think that my first exposure to nature journaling um i think i had done some field sketching when i was in uh uh, when I was at college, um, I was taking some botany classes and I, I remember going out and doing some um, field sketching or field journaling um, and that. But I think like the first real nature journaling um, resource that I found was John Muir Law's book. Uh, so I think it was one of those times where I was trying to bring art back into my life and I went to the bookstore and, you mm. know, like that book cover is just so beautiful. <laughs> So it immediately caught my eye and I was like, what is this? So I, I got the book and, um, and, and, you know, was looking through it and, and trying to do some of those exercises. And then, um, yeah, I think it just kept being something that like kept creeping into my life in, in one way or another. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I certainly like came across your program and then uh, Maureen Murphy, our, our uh, group leader in the Chicago Nature Journaling Club, um, she, you know, was posting about it and talking about it um, on her Instagram. So it's just, you know, it kept inserting it, itself into my life. And I was like, yes, this is what I need to do more of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really interested because you have a really wide range of different uh, media that you use and different styles and I'm really interested in even in your bird project you're you're using digital art you're using all sorts of different um, analog ways of of making art tell me about that of using such a wide range of things yeah. Um, well, I think one of the one of the reasons is that I am like addicted to art supplies. <laughs> so, <laughs> so any excuse to try a different medium, like I will just dive in. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I had started uh, when I got back into art. I had. I, I really gotten interested in digital art and just, you know, the ease and portability mm. that uh, working digitally provides. It's like you have all of these art materials, you know, at your disposal that are yes. just like on your iPad or on your tablet. So um, that's when I... Um, uh, when I started getting like more serious about art and doing it on a regular basis, I, I used mostly digital tools because it was just so easy. Um, but after a while, I think I got a little, well, I honestly got a little burned out on my 100 Birds of Le Bas Woods project because I was trying to churn out like two illustrations every week. Mm -hmm. And that just became like a little too much and trying to balance that with like, you know, the rest of my life. Um, 
So I decided I needed to take a pause from that. And then I started to feel like, oh, I'm on my computer so much, you mm -hmm. know, staring at a screen all day long. Like maybe I just need to use some physical materials. So I had, you know, I had watercolors. Um, and so I started, you know, practicing with those and then, you know, seeing like Liz Clayton Fuller, she uses a lot of gouache. So I wanted to try to play with that a little bit. And uh, yeah, and then it has just now snowballed from there. <laughs> now I use like color pencils and wax pastels and yeah. <laughs> but it's wonderful because it makes for a really um, wide range of um, effects that you can get. And sometimes I've been watching your, um, your paintings and sometimes you even do the same subject again in a different media and it gives a whole different effect, which is really lovely and fun. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, I feel like when I do, uh, especially when I do birds in like, let's say gouache and colored pencils, they end up being a little more realistic, a little less stylized. Um, and then, yeah, when I do things digitally, I don't know, it's just easier. I would like to get them more stylized in mm. the gouache and colored pencils, mm -hmm. but it's like easier for me to wrap my head around doing that digitally. I think I just need more practice doing that uh, in the analog media. But. And you wrote about the idea that, oh, this sort of phenomenon that happens when you're using digital uh, media that you can correct your mistakes. And that can be great and it can also be a bit of a trap because then you start to fall into this thing of like endless, endless, endless correcting and striving yes. for something that you maybe couldn't achieve otherwise. And and that can that sort of attachment to perfectionism can be difficult. Can you talk a little mm -hmm. about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um yeah, so I do I do love digital art quite a bit, but um, when I was getting to that that burnout point with it, what I was finding is that every time I was sitting out sitting down to create a piece, I was feeling like really constricted and tight. And yeah, I think it was that pressure of like, I want this to look a very specific way mm -hmm. and I could mm -hmm. keep hitting that undo button. Or, I mean, one of the, the wonderful things about Procreate is you can adjust like the hue and the saturation and the brightness, but I could do that for like for hours <laughs> <laughs> after I was finished with something. Um, and I, I was finding too that like some of the pieces of mine that I, I was happiest with and that I liked the most were the ones that took me like the least amount of time yeah. that I just didn't obsess over. And so, yeah, I did feel like it was probably going to be better for me to like try to use more of the the analog media where you can't fix mistakes or if you try to, you ruin it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I do I do think that that has been helpful. I'm 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 currently trying to just speed up my process because I mm -hmm. can still I mean I can still overwork a piece. <laughs> you know, to no end. Um, so I'm just trying to get quick so I can just try to capture like the essence of what I'm trying to do rather than trying to get it perfect. Yeah. And sometimes that whole process of deliberately loosening can be a challenge. And I love that you're doing that deliberately. I've seen you um, working on like doing quick bird sketches preparing for a piece and it's 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 counterintuitive that we have to practice being loose because the, it seems like that that tightness should be the thing that you that you practice but I think all of us have to practice getting loose and that watching you do that with purpose and in a deliberate way is cool I like it oh thank you yeah 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 it is it is kind of um you know, counterintuitive, but uh, yeah, I just, I don't know. I feel like some of the art that I love the most that other people do has that very yes. loose feel, Absolutely. right? And like, you could just see it in the lines and oh, like, it's just, it's so lovely. So I, I've, 
and I think there's just like, you just like, you just put it down and like, trust that also yeah. people are able to interpret what you are trying. Like, it doesn't yes. need to look exactly yes. like it looks in the picture necessarily. Like some people do that super, super well, but it doesn't have to be that. Like it could just be an impression. Um, so, Absolutely. so yeah. So, and I think nature journaling is good for that too, right? Like, cause you're out to outside dealing with the elements. You can't necessarily spend a ton of time on any particular thing. And if you're, if you're working on a living animal, like it's not going to stay around for you That's right. That's to be right. that deliberate. So do you ever draw with your iPad outside or is that always something you do inside? Oh, um, I, I have done it in the past. It has been a long time uh, okay. since I've, I've taken my iPad outside. It was something that I was thinking about because um, with our nature journaling club, I mean, we meet every month uh, at the end of the month all year long. So mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, it's below freezing and your fingers are cold and it's really hard to hold your tools or your paint is freezing or, you know, all of that stuff. So I was contemplating like, oh, maybe I should bring my iPad out one of these like really cold meetups. Mm -hmm. um, but but yeah, I don't know. I Maybe I'll do that uh, at the end of this month. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> and what's your favorite media to use when you're actually out with the group nature journaling? Mm, yeah. Um, I mean, I think, I think watercolors are, are really nice to use in that situation. But uh, last month I tried out uh, my uh, water soluble markers mm -hmm. and uh, the wax pastels. Um, and I've also, I've also brought my gouache out with me, gouache and colored pencils. I've done that a couple of times and I like that setup. I actually really like using gouache outside and I think I might prefer it to watercolor because it dries faster. Okay. So, and that's always like, I am not patient when it comes to drying time. <laughs> So um, that was one of the things when I was using gouache in the field. I was like, oh, this is great. It's already dry. Like I can add another layer. I can mm -hmm. add some details now. Um, and I don't have to wait for that, that page to dry. <laughs> do you find it hard to switch back and forth between the techniques of gouache and watercolor? Or do they, because certain ways of using gouache, it's opposite to uh, watercolor in that you would start with the dark colors and then end mm -hmm. with the light colors and in watercolor it's the opposite do you mm -hmm. flow freely between the two or does it <laughs> yeah I mean, some I, switching <laughs> <laughs> yeah I don't know if it's I, I would say that use the term freely but <laughs> <laughs> um I I definitely I think at this point I feel more comfortable with gouache mm -hmm. um I don't feel like my uh skills at watercolor are um, as good. I just don't think I have, have practiced nearly mm -hmm. enough with the watercolors. Um, but in terms of switching back and forth, I feel like I'm getting a lot better at that because like with um, a lot of the media, like you, you end up starting light and building the layers and making them darker. And then it's like when you, when you switch to using something like digital or gouache, it's almost like, oh yes, I have a little more freedom here. I can <laughs> do things a little differently. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it, it adds some variety uh, to my practice, which I enjoy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You also enjoy being part of art challenges. And mm. uh, <laughs> at the moment, you're doing a daily, a daily art thing in, in January. Tell me, tell me about this thing of art challenges. And then we'll talk about your January daily art. Sure. Um, yeah, so I think just art challenges in general can be helpful, um, just in terms of providing some motivation, you yeah. know, to work on art daily. And I think that, you know, in the end, that making a time for a daily art practice is probably the best thing that anybody can do in building their skill. Um, so, you know, a lot of people uh, talk about talent, and I know that's, you know, a topic you've talked about <laughs> on this podcast before. Um, and yeah, I, I really don't, uh, I don't believe in talent, or I think my uh, perspective on talent is it's really just uh, motivation yeah. and persistence. Yeah, right. I agree. And so I think daily art challenges 
provide you with both of those things. Um, so that's why I've engaged in them in the past. And then like, you know, like Birdtober, I can't pass up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's basically my art practice all year round. <laughs> so if there's a whole month surrounding it, like I'm all in. Um, and then, yeah, the 100 Birds Project, I think that's what kind of got me started. And yeah. just like, okay, yeah, like if I just start working on birds and, and doing uh, this art regularly, like, I'm bound to get better during that process. Yeah, absolutely. So. And then at the end, I mean, you step through this process again and again. And um, then at the end, you have a collection, an amazing collection of something yeah. that's really inspiring and wonderful and inspiration to look to look back on. Yeah, yeah. It's so cool to see like how things change throughout the progression of that challenge. And um yeah, like with the the Hunter Birds project, I mean, I'm still I'm still in the midst of that, right? Like I had this idea that I was going to finish that in a year and now I think it's been over 2 years and it's still not done, but that's okay, right? Totally. Like <laughs> um I picked up some other things along the way and like switched over to using uh more of the analog media and did Birdtober and now yeah, doing this January daily art challenge and it's it's all good. Tell me about the changes you mentioned changes that you've seen over that progression. Tell me what you've noticed. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I, um, I certainly like started getting a better sense of my style, like mm. figuring out what I like to do and what I don't like to do. Um, also, you know, integrating those other media into uh, my artwork, um, you know, happened throughout that that process and you know getting a really I feel like that process also helped me get like a better sense of like using contrast mm. or you know figuring out like composition and uh yeah when I started out like my my skills were you know fairly basic and now I feel like I have a much better understanding and I feel like I could see that in in the work as it goes along that's really wonderful because sometimes people say I don't know how to find a style. I don't know how to settle on what's me. And I think the answer to that is just to keep going, just keep doing it and doing it and doing it. And your style, it naturally emerges. You don't have to search for it. It just comes. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you figure out like, okay, I really like using this tool or, um, I don't like using this. This is my favorite brush. And then, yes. you know, then your brush strokes end up looking like very similar across the pieces or even like, I really love this particular, like hue of magenta and yes. like, and then you use that in all of your pieces and it just ends up making them look uniform and giving you a style. Yeah, yeah. and right. even in like digital media, like I now because I like when I started, I was trying all of these different brushes and all of these different techniques, and now I'm like, okay, for the background, I know I'm going to do this. Yes. I know I want to use this brush for the detail. I know I want to use these textures, and so yeah, it just uh, it can happen with any any tool that you're using. Would you say you're a lifelong learner? You seem to be someone who who loves to learn and and does that deliberately and with purpose. Yes. Yeah. I, I definitely am a, a lifelong learner. I, um, yeah. And I have a lot of different, uh, different kinds of interests. Um, and so, yeah, I think if I just come across a topic that, you know, is really, uh, interesting or fascinating, like I tend to like dive in and try to learn as much as I can. And I think, you know, with um, nature and especially birds, like that is a very deep rabbit hole that you, <laughs> <laughs> yes. you could you could just remain lost in forever. Um, so that has been that has been great. I mean, there's so much to learn about birds. There's so much to learn about art, and there's so many like fantastic people to learn from. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it it helps to keep life uh, really interesting. You know. It's wonderful that you can bring these two things that you love together, birding and art. That's really enriching to have two passions in one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I agree. I feel I feel really lucky. I, I feel, 
yeah it's 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 neat because i think they both like feed off of each other really Absolutely. well like i you know i become a better birder because i'm yeah. doing all of these like very detailed observations when i'm creating an art piece um and i also feel like i become a better artist because when i'm out birding i'm like observing the environment i'm like seeing how you know everything is like working together in nature and like how nature composes things and it just uh yeah, it's like a constant source of inspiration either way. Absolutely. So you wanted to get better at uh, painting landscapes. And so you've committed to this January challenge, which is all about landscapes. Let's talk a little about that. Yeah, yeah. So, well, nature journaling was actually my um, inspiration for getting better at landscapes, because actually last month when uh, we were at our meetup, I was trying to do the landscape. We were at this uh, nature preserve and there's this really lovely pond and like all of these beautiful trees around it. I'm like, OK, I'm going to try it. And I... <laughs> I could not wrap my head around what to do um, with that landscape. And so I was like, okay, I was looking at some classes on like Skillshare and on YouTube, just how do people actually do this? And then I came across that January um, daily art challenge from, you know, an artist on Instagram that I follow. And I was like, oh, well, I know an art challenge is going to certainly help yeah. me get better. Um, so I'm going to join this and that'll just provide me with my motivation. Um, and it's a really cool challenge because uh, the artist Jen she um, on her Patreon every week she posts uh, the six reference photos that everybody's going to be working off of. So we do quick sketches on the first day, and then we do like a more detailed sketch of each individual photo uh, for the rest of the week. And so it's been really good at like forcing me to work on landscapes on a regular basis. It's also been really cool to see everybody else in the challenge, yeah. like how they are interpreting the landscapes and what materials they are using. Um, and then I was like, yes, I was very keen to like just do landscapes and that was it. But I think it was it was maybe on the, the second day. I was like, well, there has to be a bird in this. I, I noticed this. I wanted to talk to you about it. It's so cute. So you've got the landscape, you're, re you're using a reference photo and you just uh, have been uh, popping a bird in that might occur in, <laughs> in that particular landscape. It made me smile so much. I love it. Oh, good. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. <laughs> so you, so say it's a picture, uh, a landscape in Scotland. You, you look for birds that might go, might occur there. That's nice because yeah. it gives you, helps you research other areas and. Exactly. Yeah. So actually what I usually do is I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to find, um, so all of these, uh, these reference photos are on Unsplash. So, you mm -hmm. know, they're royalty free photos. And I, if I can find the reference photo, like sometimes the photographer will put where they took the picture. Uh, so I do like kind of a deep dive and like trying to figure this out. And then I pull up eBird, um, which is, you know, a website where people from all around the world report their bird sightings. It is a fantastic resource. It's not, it's used heavily in here in North America, and then it's used um, in a lot of other areas across the globe. But um, so I'll pull up like the eBird uh, sightings, like for that particular area. And That's sometimes, so cool. you know, it'll show like who's there. And it's really, eBird's actually like a really fantastic resource for artists because you can, um, once you pull up that species, uh, you can see, okay, when it's been there, you know, what times of year it frequents that specific location. And then photographers will um, put their photos in eBird as well. And some of them, I mean, are like such amazingly mm. beautiful photos. Um, so you can see the species in the habitat, like right there. And then you can also filter for like time of year oh, or fantastic. like if they're with other species, you could like do all of these other things. So you can kind of get a real good sense of like what that bird looks like in that specific location. What so that's what I've resource? been... Yeah, isn't that so, it's so cool. Uh, so that's what I've been doing for this particular process is I'll go out to eBird, I'll look to see what birds are there. And, then, uh, and I'll be like, oh, this one looks like it could work in this composition. I'll pop them in somewhere. I love it. I love it. What a great project to, to be involved with. And especially because you're using the same reference photos as others, you can see how they're, how they're doing it and yeah. get inspired in that way. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really cool. You can see like, um, you could definitely see like a lot of people are very um, practiced at drawing landscapes because they'll even like change the perspective, okay. but you could still see it's the same spot. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah. just, yeah, it's fantastic. So. Do you find um, birding and art communities online are nourishing for you? Yes, absolutely. And I, um, so I mean, I'm mostly when I'm online, I'm mostly on Instagram. Um, I don't really spend time in any other social media sites. And I know like, you know, there can be a lot of downsides to Instagram mm -hmm. and there can be a lot of like, you know, getting stuck in the endless scrolling mm -hmm. um, and also like the comparison trap of like seeing all of these other amazing photographers or artists um, and, and, and feeling bad about yourself if you're comparing yourself to them. But I also think like it can be a really fantastic community and uh, that's what, that's definitely what I've experienced, you know, yeah. like, um, I, there are so many wonderful artists out there. There's so many wonderful birders. I've made a lot of friends on Instagram yes. who have become friends in like real life that yes. then I like actually met in person. Um, and then also friends, you know, like on the internet that I've, you know, never met in person, but I still feel like are, you know, good friends. Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful. And once you feel like you're, you got your head around landscapes. Do you have, are there other things in the future that you hope to tackle? Are there things, are there goals that you have or things you want to develop in the future? Yeah. So I, um, I think once this January daily art challenge is over, I'm, um, I'm contemplating just trying to keep that up uh as like just a regular just doing daily yeah. art and posting right. daily art as a regular practice um i i need to figure it out in a way that's sustainable for me like i don't know if it'll be seven days a week it yes. might be six days a week or five yeah. days a week and then i also like in um in addition to posting like my drawings and paintings you know i'll go back to posting my um photography art and then um i'm also been um i i'm picking up needlework again because that was something that i um, had done previously so um i've been you know kind of like re-embracing that art form so i'll probably be posting some of those projects as well and are your needlework uh, projects birds as well of course yeah <laughs> I could have guessed it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. They weren't previously, but yeah. yeah, now they are. Right now, I'm working on a uh, a long eared owl, which is a oh, really wow. like uh, owls a bit of a theme for you species. I mean, they're just really they're such fascinating animals, and they're so beautiful, yeah. and they're just. I don't know. I they're I don't know. They're just very special. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, I love them. So um, so yeah. I think um, in terms of the daily art, like that's something that I'm definitely contemplating. I also um, part of doing that is I also want to share stuff that's maybe unfinished or yes. maybe that I don't love, but yes. just like showing that like you know part of doing art is like you're not going to kick out a masterpiece every day. And sometimes yes. it's not great. And that's just what art is. And it's a process. And you, you know, part of getting better is just pushing through that and, and being able to embrace those mistakes and learn from them. Yeah, I think that's really important. I think everything is so curated these days that uh, it does exacerbate that feeling of comparison and oh, my, my journals don't look like that every day. Yes. And yeah, I, I like that. I like that thought. Yeah, yeah. And it's scary because I'm like, oh, I'm going to totally. put out some pretty <laughs> crappy pieces and I'll probably lose a ton of followers, but oh, oh well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's wonderful. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's been so fun to chat with you and learn more about your practice. Oh, thank you so much, Beth. And it's been so great speaking with you. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Kelly. I found her passion for birding very inspirational and, in fact, I've since found myself a birding friend who I'm going to tag along with on a few outings because I want to learn more about birds myself now. I loved listening to Kelly speak about appreciating the migratory birds that pass through her city on their way to other places and making sure to get outside birding even when the conditions might make other people tuck up under a blanket on the couch. 
please take a look at the show notes and follow the link to Kelly's website where you'll find a gallery of all the bird species that she's painted so far in her 100 Birds project. Thank you so much for listening. See you next week. 